Now, good afternoon, everybody. We're on a fairly tight time schedule today, so we'll get started straight away. First, can I remind you to switch your phones to silent, but we encourage you to tweet, those of you who tweet, uh, using the handle at IIEA. Now, that doesn't mean an awful lot to me personally, but I hope it means a lot to all of you. Um, and as you know, the initial address is on the record, and then the Q&A is under Chatham House rules. And I will ask people, if there's time for some questions, to just identify themselves. We're very honoured indeed today to have Sir Julian King, who is the Commissioner for Security Union since 2016. Um, he joined the Foreign Service and uh, the Commonwealth Service in 1985. And, of course, what we remember most about him is because he was our, the UK ambassador here in Ireland. Um, but he has also uh, been the EU Commission che Chef de Cabinet to the Commissioner for Trade, UK representative on the EU Political and Security Committee, graduate of Oxford University and École Nationale d'Administration Paris. He is somebody who is dealing with the topic that we've had discussions here at, the, at this institute before, but um, in the role of, of commissioner, we're hoping now that we'll get s sort of some deeper understanding of what is happening with regard to security, cyber crime, <laughs> cyber instances. It's something that we all have to, particularly those of us over a certain age, have to recognise now it's part and parcel of our, of our lives and part and parcel of what governments have to handle. And I just, if I, if you don't, I hope I'm not repeating something you'll say, but I mean, in the past 12 months in a speech that the Commissioner made, um, the cyber threat landscape has changed significantly and the challenges we face from cyber attacks and other cyber enabled threats have evolved and grown. And we're finding ourselves now battling to prevent our elections from being interfered with, combating attempts at manipulation through the malicious use of disinformation. Now, those, those are sort of harsh words and frightening words about our, the state of where we are. You know, going back, way back in Ireland, you know, we'd, we, we had landline phones and that was about it, you know. But now I'm afraid the whole world is our oyster. We can uh, contact anybody anywhere in the world, but equally somebody can contact us from anywhere in the world. So these are the kind of things that we have to think about. So I'm really pleased that Commissioner Julian King is here to talk to us and hopefully there'll be a little time at the end for some comments yeah. and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great, uh, it's great to be back here uh, in Dublin again. Uh, and I mean that despite the weather yes. yesterday afternoon, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, I've spent uh, many happy uh, times here. Uh, you recalled um, that briefly I was ambassador here. Uh, I also spent many happy times down here when I was working uh, in the north. Uh, I have to say, if you told me when I was doing any of those roles, uh, or indeed later, uh, when I was uh, quietly ensconced in Paris in 2016, uh, the circumstances of my return here today, I'm not sure I would have believed you then. Um, I have had an opportunity to speak once before here since I started as Commissioner of the Security Union. And when I spoke last time, uh, my main focus was on the work we were doing to counter uh, terrorism in particular the uh, Islamist uh, extremist terrorist threat. Uh, and I just wanted to say before I talk about other things uh, that that threat has uh, not gone away uh, and remains a challenge for us all and a real and live concern, even as the last remnants of the Daesh Caliphate are uh, rolled up in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, there were still 26... Uh, Islamist extremist terrorist incidents across Europe uh, last year. A small number of attacks, but a much larger number of failed or foiled uh, attacks. Uh, we, all of us, face the challenge of what to do about uh, returning foreign terrorist fighters and non-combatant women and children. That is a security and indeed a, a societal uh, challenge. And there is still a lot of very pernicious radicalizing material that is having an effect uh, with particularly vulnerable young people being turned down the route of violence. Uh, There's still far too much of that material 
uh, online, for example. So this, this is a challenge that remains, and I don't want to overlook it. But today, uh, I wanted to accept your invitation to focus on some of the, the newer challenges uh, facing Europe and what we're trying to do about them. Uh, and in particular, to talk a little bit about cyber challenges, cyber-enabled challenges, particularly around disinformation, disinformation in the political space that you mentioned, um, how we uh, do better to ensure or assure the integrity of our critical digital infrastructure, what we need to do to take seriously some of the uh, unconventional uh, illegal means that are used to attack us, including uh, chemical uh, attacks, uh, and what the shifting threat picture means for uh, what we can do in the EU around defence. So starting with cyber and cyber-enabled threats, uh, as you said, uh, these have grown uh, significantly in recent years, and awareness around them has uh, increased as they've had more and more of an impact on our everyday lives. Uh, the emergence of these non-conventional means as a channel for aggressive action without having to have resort to traditional military measures uh, has, I think, fundamentally changed the role and indeed the responsibility that the EU has and can play, even as it remains predominantly a civilian organisation. But it does have this role now in security and defence matters because the threats that we're talking about subvert civilian infrastructure and democratic processes as much uh, as any other, and they are real security challenges because of their power to generate chaos, dissent, and disruption. In our reaction to the increase in cyber threats, we in the Commission began by tackling the challenge posed by what you might call classic cybersecurity threats those which target systems and, and data. Uh, we uh, developed a new uh, cybersecurity strategy back in 2017, and since then we've been rolling it out uh, and trying to get it implemented through agreement with the member states uh, and with the European Parliament around three pillars of resilience, deterrence, and boosting international cooperation. Uh, and in practice, that's included the creation of a a first genuine EU cybersecurity agency at European level, uh, which will help develop a new EU wide certification system to boost resilience and cybersecurity of online services and consumer devices, in particular, those billions of Internet of Things devices that are going to be a bigger and bigger part of our lives, as well as to coordinate the response to large scale incidents uh, if and when they uh, take place. Uh, because resilience also relies, obviously, on technology, the closer you are to the cutting edge of technology, the uh, more resilient you are, uh, we've proposed a network of competence centres uh, across Europe uh, with a hub at its centre to drive, to stimulate and drive the development and deployment of necessary cyber security, uh, R&D uh, and technologies going hand in hand with the aim of turning cybersecurity into something of a competitive advantage for European industry. Last year also saw um, the deadline for the coming into force of some key building blocks of our cybersecurity, uh, a directive on security of networks and information systems that says you have to have plans and preparations for dealing with cybersecurity of your key infrastructure, and the famous uh, GDPR that we were talking about a little bit uh, downstairs. Uh, these are very important measures. They do need to be effectively implemented by all of the member states. At the same time, we took some important steps on deterrence to create some better, uh, more credible disincentives for those who might contemplate attacking us through cyber means. Uh, so we're stepping up cooperation and sharing uh, of expertise reinforcing cyber forensics and detection capabilities across uh, the European Union. Uh, we've taken steps to increase law enforcement access to the kind of evidence, electronic evidence, that they need to prosecute uh, these attacks, including when it's hosted in a different country. Uh, and 
uh, we are putting in place a set of measures for a joint EU diplomatic response, a political response, as well as a law enforcement response to malicious cyber activities, uh, the so-called cyber diplomacy toolbox, which includes working together with third countries and, if necessary, uh, taking sanctions when you can attribute with confidence uh, an attack to uh, a third country. We're in the process, actually, of finalizing a set of cyber sanctions uh, uh, to that end. So that's the panoply of things that we've been doing on classic cyber. As well as that, of course, we've also seen uh, the continued growth and evolution of cyber-enabled threats, especially those aimed at manipulating our, our democratic processes, casting a shadow over our democratic institutions. There has been, I'm afraid, a pattern of interference in elections, uh, both sides of the Atlantic. We've documented um, uh, 30 different examples of uh, attempted or, in some cases, successful uh, interference in democratic processes uh, over uh, recent years. And obviously, we're conscious that the uh, upcoming European parliamentary elections uh, later this spring in uh, at least 27 member states uh, present a particularly tempting target with potential, uh, if successful, to deadlock the EU's legislative capacity for much of the next five years. Uh, so in response, we've brought forward uh, a series of proposals uh, aimed at tackling disinformation and the manipulation of data and behavior in the political space. Now, we're calling for action on longer-term challenges, which are very important, such as ensuring media diversity, building critical awareness. But we also need to take some action now. We need to see an improvement in how we detect and call out disinformation. Uh, we need to better protect uh, elections in particular by working with the member states uh, to develop a rapid alert system for spotting, mapping, and reacting to uh, coordinated uh, disinformation campaigns. But perhaps most importantly, uh, we need to see the big internet platforms, the big social media platforms, step up and play uh, their role. In uh, what is an international first, we've agreed a code of good practice with some of the major social media platforms. Facebook, Google, and Twitter have joined us in that, and I want to recognize their engagement. But they need now to follow through on what they agreed to in the code of practice. We urgently need to see improvements in how political adverts are placed online, greater transparency around sponsored content, the rapid and effective identification and deletion of fake accounts, clearer rules around bots, i.e. machines, not humans, circulating political content, more effective promotion of alternative narratives, and greater clarity around how this is working, how the algorithms that push information are working, greater openness to independent uh, scrutiny. We're in a process now of reporting each month on progress in the run-up to the European parliamentary elections. Um, we've, we've done two rounds of reporting. And, and I have to say, unfortunately, uh, that um, uh, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, in the latest reporting, despite some progress, rather than improve, overall the platforms have fallen further behind where we need to be, given the prospect of the elections. So uh, Facebook have, I'm afraid, failed to provide uh, hard data uh, and information, including any data on the actions it's taken at the last part of last year and the beginning of this year, on scrutiny of ad placements or efforts to disrupt advertising and monetization incentives for those who are peddling disinformation. Twitter. Uh, have not reported on any additional efforts at the beginning of this year to improve ad placement or information on the implementation of its ad transparency center in the EU. Google fared slightly better, uh, reporting on scrutiny of ad placement, uh, a policy for election ads, dedicated teams to prevent election-related abuse of its services. But even they 
uh, didn't provide any data on enforcement of their policies. So we've called again on the platforms to go further and faster in order to have the necessary impact before May's elections and to meet the commitments that, after all, they signed up to in the code. It's not something that we invented. Uh, and to give us the information we need to be able to work with them to hold them to account. Frankly, uh, as someone said in a different context, uh, the clock is ticking. Uh, if we're going to ensure those elections are fair and free, then we need some real action on this. Now, as well as those cyber and cyber-enabled threats, Europe also needs to look at and be thinking about the security and integrity of its underlying critical digital infrastructure. Now, this is an issue that's been in the headlines recently. Um, you have all read about uh, a particular company uh, from a particular country <coughs> where there are questions uh, to do with uh, the 5G networks. But for me, it's a larger question than that. It's about building and strengthening our digital resilience. Digital resilience, after all, is crucial for protecting government information, industrial research, intellectual property, business plans, elections, our democratic institutions, as well as our own personal data. And in order to have faith in your digital resilience, the plumbing of your uh, society, of our modern connected lives, you need to protect the digital infrastructure. As well as 5G, that means the cloud, Internet of Things devices, and uh, AI, the possibility to use artificial intelligence to process for good or for ill huge amounts of personal data. And all of those changes are happening at the same time, which is why this uh, debate has bubbled up. In Europe, from a European perspective, I think we need to discuss whether we're happy to continue, as now, to see our own cutting-edge technologies sold off one after another. We need to consider um, how to minimize the risk of allowing one dominant supplier to emerge across the whole continent in these crucial sectors. And we need to look at whether deeper European coordination would allow our collective investment in something like AI and other vital technologies, quantum computing, cryptography, to be more than the sum of their parts. And these are going to raise some very challenging issues around national decision making. All of these are core national decisions. We also have to recognize that pretending we can protect everything isn't realistic. It won't work. But we do need to decide what really matters. Uh, in terms of our digital resilience and this core digital uh, ecosystem. And whether greater transparency around suppliers, supply chains, foreign uh, investment is going to be enough to offset the security risks, or whether it may be that some pieces of backbone digital infrastructure are simply too critical to risk. Now, as I said at the start, alongside these digital issues, uh, we also have to face uh, a challenge from unconventional, illegal uh, risks like CBRN, something which was thrust back into the spotlight a year ago today uh, when the Skipals were poisoned by Russian agents using a military-grade nerve agent on the streets of a small city in the United Kingdom. If it can happen on the streets of Salisbury, uh, it can happen anywhere in Europe. We'd already uh, reviewed um, a little bit before that uh, our provisions on chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear risks. But I have to say, we'd concluded that they were low probability, high impact. Unfortunately, Salisbury showed that they weren't such low probability. And that's why we've been pressing for urgent um, progress on uh, these challenges. Uh, reducing the accessibility of CBRM materials, bolstering our preparedness and resilience, building stronger links with key regional and international partners, NATO uh, and the US. We have, I'm glad to say, made some progress in concrete measures to address the chemical threat by working together with member states to develop a list of chemical substances posing particular threat and improving our detection capacity 
and launching a public-private dialogue to explore ways of better controlling access to these dangerous chemical substances. But there's still a lot more to do in that field. Which brings us uh, closer to the world of traditional defense. I just want to say a few words, uh, given that the set of rapidly evolving threats that I've been describing, uh, the clear sense that those are challenges that transcend national borders, and frankly, uh, the shifting global geopolitical landscape, to put it politely, uh, we have, I think, seen a, a new sense in Europe amongst Europeans that we need to take uh, more ownership for ourselves in defending and protecting uh, our citizens. That, that said, core defense, of course, remains the responsibility of the member states, uh, and they exercise it in Europe uh, very largely through NATO. While the European Union can't act as a substitute for member states' national defense programs, it can encourage collaboration in developing the technology and equipment needed to address common uh, security and defense challenges, while, of course, fully respecting the different national positions on defense, including here. Uh, in 2015, Europe was the world's second largest military spender at 210 billion euros. Half the US figure, but more than three times what Russia was spending. Even after Brexit, it will still be the second largest spender worldwide. And yet we've always got less bang for our buck than these other uh, uh, US, Russia, and others. Uh, we have too much uh, overlap and duplication. Collectively, that's led us to punch below our weight. Uh, lower investment per soldier in terms of equipment and R&D, proliferations of different types, the same sort of equipment. That's why some of the initiatives that we've sought to promote from the Commission, like Permanent Structured Corporation or PESCO and the European Defence Fund, have the potential to be so useful. We're not talking about tanks and guns here, but rather areas such as uh, metamaterials, encrypted software, drone technology, and the aim is to help member states reduce duplications in spending and get better value for money in some of these cutting edge areas. All of this in full respect of our core values. So all the projects under the European Defence Fund, for example, uh, will have to comply with international law and be implemented in accordance with the highest ethical standards. If uh, the member states agree what we propose for the budget for the future, uh, the period 2021 to 27, uh, the EDF would be funded to uh, the tune of 13 billion and would be a significant player in driving uh, cooperation in these fields. <laughs> PESCO, meanwhile, offers a way for willing member states to cooperate more closely, in particular uh, on security and defense projects, uh, funding, developing, deploying military capabilities together. Uh, we've got about 34 different projects on the go at the moment, and I'm very glad that Ireland is investing and engaging in those. Now, you've listened very patiently, um, and I owe it, therefore, to you, I think, to say something briefly about the elephant in the room. Uh, everything we've done so far has been um, uh, beginning with C or D. Um, as someone once said... Uh, there are only two tragedies in life. One is not getting what one wants, and the other is getting it. Uh, I suppose there might be a message about Brexit in there somewhere. Um, it's not really for me, as, uh, as you know, to uh, major on uh, this subject and the wider situation, because you know, I don't speak for uh, the UK government, and my, uh, Michel Barnier uh, is in charge of things on the, on the EU side. Uh, but I do want to say that whatever else happens with this story, and in particular, whatever difficult discussions lie ahead on, for example, economic issues and future economic partnership, when it comes to security and uh, the security dimension of the future EU-UK partnership, I hope, I sincerely hope, that we can keep in mind the overwhelming shared self-interest of maintaining, and indeed in some of these fields that are moving fast, strengthening the deep intertwined practical cooperation that's developed over uh, recent years. 
But because an objective is clear, doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy or straightforward to achieve. Once the UK leaves the EU, it ceases to be a member state. It becomes a third country outside of Schengen. That is the logical consequence of uh, what is uh, being debated in, in the House of Parliament again next week. That doesn't mean there will cease to be a relationship, but that relationship and cooperation will need to be forged anew, negotiated and agreed on a new basis. And that relationship will need to respect the position of both parties, HMG, but also of the <coughs> EU27. Building a deep relationship in security and defense will mean finding ways to tackle some quite complex issues around rules and safeguards, for example, on, on data, and on dispute settlement and enforcement, vital in this as in other areas. Again, it'll be difficult to ignore that the EU has a desire for greater autonomy in some aspects of defense and security. So the challenge is to find the right basis for cooperation. There are a number of hurdles that need to be cleared if we're going to do this, but for the reasons we all know and for some of the reasons I've just set out, it is profoundly in our shared interests that we make a joint effort to try and clear uh, those hurdles. Because we live in uncertain times, Whatever happens with the rest of, of Brexit in the coming weeks and months, I, I do remain uh, positive, optimistic, that the close and lasting partnership between the UK and Ireland and the UK and indeed the rest of Europe will endure, something which is uh, vital if we're going to successfully tackle the security and defence challenges that we face today. May the roof above us never fall in. May we friends beneath it never fall out. Thank you.